All right. So my talk is, uh, well, first of all, I guess I better give a slight introduction to myself. Uh, I'm Greg Farrow. Um, my talk's going to be about GNU Emacs as an example of software freedom in practice, kind of uh, practice in the sense not that we're practicing uh, as in tr training for something, but practice as in it's sort of enacting uh, the core values of GNU as a, as a project. Um, what I do, I'm the campaigns manager at the Free Software Foundation. Um, this is not an FSF talk officially. Uh, so all of my opinions are my own. I don't think I'll say anything especially controversial uh, during this, at least I hope not. Um, I'm an Emacs user since about 2006, uh, when I was age 12. Uh, but that does not mean that I'm especially good at Emacs. Um, I'm not a programmer, not at all really. Uh, my college education was in ancient Greek, uh, not computer science. So while you know, I may know one or two things about a certain kind of lambda, I don't really know much at all about the other kind of lambda. So my use of Emacs is always very kind of like cobbling together a lot of different things from like various config files all over the place. And it's it's been a little like hodgepodge over the years. So even though I use it for everything and I use it, have used it for such a long time, um, you know, it's not uh, not something I consider myself a big expert at. Um, and some proofs that I'm not a hacker. Well, okay, first of all, the, the delay in this presentation. Um, but I'm also, or was before Zoe uh, lended me her laptop, uh, I was planning to use this for a 14-year-old laptop because I broke mine while trying to fix it. So clearly, I don't have the uh, MIT AI lab spirits behind me. Uh, I can't use org mode very well, as evidenced by this presentation. And I still can't record Emacs macros reliably. That's the whole Mac part, right? But no, I still can't do it. Uh, but I can write Greek letters reliably. And there's a very crudely written Emacs. Thank you uh, to its <laughs> brilliant Unicode support. Uh, but there's a, there's a little bit of a catch to that, right? So like some of the earliest Emacs users weren't much of programmers either. Um, RMS, in his kind of account of uh, his days at the AI, AI lab and the development of GNU Emacs, said that programming new editing commands in Emacs was so convenient that even the secretaries in his office started learning how to use it, the his being uh, someone else at the AI lab, not RMS. Uh, they used a manual someone had written, which showed how to extend Emacs, but didn't say it was programming. So the secretaries who believed that they couldn't do programming weren't scared off. They read the manual, discovered they could do useful things, and they learned to program. And that's always been a very interesting quote to me because it sort of uh, highlights what I'll call uh, in the next slide, this kind of like mind expansion moment that I was just talking to someone about uh, the other day. And it's like, if you're used to typical programs, if you're used to, you know, just like the rundown of non-free programs like Microsoft Office, et cetera, et cetera, um, and you go to Emacs, you think it's this weird arcane thing and you don't understand why the M actually refers to the alt key on your keyboard and just, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. You have to feel like you're an octopus to use it, etc. cetera. Um, but most everyone that I know who has uh, used Emacs for a long time can say that one moment where things seem to like click for them, right? They come to an understanding of e Emacs's extensibility for the first time and are empowered by all that they suddenly realize they're able to do. And I mean empowered in like a very actual sense of empowerment, right? They're like, wow, I can suddenly do all this stuff. And that's just incredible that I can do this with a computer. Um, and that's kind of just tangentially, that's something that you don't often get in education surrounding proprietary software because you're essentially using to use, uh, or learning to use one office suite when you're in school, right? You're not learning any kind of general purpose computing concept. And I think that's important that when people come to Emacs, you know, they, they, they have this moment where they realize like, oh my gosh, I'm not terrible at computers after all. I can actually, you know, adapt it to fit my needs. Um, but these people often suffer from imposter syndrome, right? Like sometimes they never end up considering themselves quote unquote real Emacs users. Um, I'm guilty of that, even though like most people in the FSF office consider me to be like the quintessential Emacs user. Uh, I don't feel that way, you know, personally. I just kind of have slowly accumulated everything um, into Emacs. It's just kind of taken over my life gradually. Maybe that's like more owing to it than me, but you know, it's it, it's something that's definitely real, especially like if you start to think about 
contributing to Emacs, you're always like, well, you know, I can't, you know, do anything. My my patches won't matter. They'll, you know, reject them or whatever. But that's uh, I don't know. That's that's something that I feel like we should be kind of counteracting when we talk about uh, getting started with Emacs and getting uh, contributing to Emacs. Um, so I've come up with my own kind of criteria for being an Emacs hacker, right? So if you've customized Emacs to any degree to cleverly help it fit your needs, you are an Emacs hacker. I am the FSF campaign manager, and I'm telling you that right now. Um, if you've had that Emacs experience that I just mentioned, you're an Emacs hacker as well. Um, there's no high bar of entry. It's just, you know, if, if you enjoy the program, if you enjoy its, enjoy its like incredibly bizarre, arcane, kind of baroque complexity, great. You know, hop on board the Emacs train because like we are happy to have you there. Um, but what, is, what does all that really mean? I mean, Emacs ability to blow people's minds, it comes from more than just it's sitting on top of a Lisp interpreter, right? And it also, at least I think, comes from more than it's being around for a really long time. Uh, software freedom itself plays a large part of it, and I would argue maybe the most crucial part of uh, the reason for Emacs is success. Um, how does software freedom help Emacs? Well, okay, first of all, the, the whole like thing, the whole catch of Emacs, right, is that anyone at any time can study and alter the code of Emacs without recompiling it, without doing anything difficult. And essentially that's software freedom one in a nutshell, right? The GNU uh, free software definition says, the freedom to study how the program works and to change it so that it does your computing as you wish, that's freedom one. Access to the source code is a precondition for this. And that's sort of like, you could make that, you could write that on the Emacs family crest, right? Like you can see all of the source code, you can edit it in any moment and that's like phenomenal. And I think that's a lot of what makes uh, Emacs accessible to people. You know, once they go beyond just kind of using it and and learning certain key commands, but when they actually start like doing that, in, you know, that first cool control X, control E, and they evaluate something for the first time, that's like a very, very good feeling. Um, and, you know, I think of, of Emacs as in some ways being the flagship GNU program, right? It's it's not the one that's most used by everybody. You know, that's probably core utils or bash, but it emphasizes what I, at least my interpretation of the GNU philosophy in a very special way. You know, while it's so like gnarly and crazy, every feature is welcome in it, right? E even MX Butterfly and even the kitchen sink, right? As the, as the old Emacs logo used to be literally a kitchen sink. Uh, the only requirement placed on you is, is to just be a good member of the Emacs community, right? To share your work back to the Emacs community, even if it's something that, you know, isn't considered like useful in terms of, in terms of like the working world, you know, like implementing a psychotherapist in uh, underused programming language or writing a Tetris clone or whatever, you know, that's something that I think could only exist in like a free software environment right like nobody at microsoft could go like hey why don't we add a adlerian uh therapist to microsoft office instead of clippy like that would be a really great idea and that would get shot down really quickly <laughs> i think um and another key part of emacs is the other uh software freedoms right it's we can modify and distribute it uh it's extremely difficult to imagine an emacs that wasn't modifiable or where modifiable versions couldn't be shared to the broader community um, if at the beginning Emacs had been licensed permissively, say under the MIT or BSD licenses, uh, something like this might have happened. You know, we could have had a less wonderful core Emacs and all the good bits of it, like the psychotherapist and maggot, and you know, my favorite theme, which is silkworm. Uh, it could have been part of this cool proprietary distribution that was, you know, locked up on the part of somebody who was benefiting from a sort of core Emacs that was free software. So copyleft is very integral. Um, to the success of Emacs, I think, and why it's so, you know, unique and why it's so widely, widely spread. Um, and here's another quote about being divided and helpless. Uh, it's a matter of the freedom to cooperate. We're used to thinking of, thinking of freedom and cooperation with a society as if they were opposites, but here they're on the same side. So with free software, i.e. Emacs, you're free to cooperate with other people as well as free to help yourself. But with not free software, someone is dominating you and keeping people divided. You're not allowed to share with them. You're not free to co cooperate or help society any more than you're free to help yourself, right? Divided and helpless is the state of users using non-free software. Um, and really, that's that's we've we've heard multiple instances of that's what it's like 
using um, just general uh, productivity applications in general if they're not free software, right? It always kind of depends on this email that you have to send the developer saying like, oh, please, please, please add this feature for me. You know, please, I'll give you so much money, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, in the free software community, just just throw it in. You know, it's it's likely to get included, if, if not in ELPA, you know, in the core Emacs. And that's that's something that's really cool. Um, so spreading the message. So we have the GPL. Cool. We have Emacs. Cool. What, but what else has contributed to its success? Uh, and there's one license that I haven't mentioned, and I hope it, it is the most controversial thing I'll say today. Uh, maybe it won't be, but uh, here we go. Uh, so the GNU free documentation license has a clause for invariant sections, right? That's a section that you can't take out of uh, the documentation, and that pertains to part of the Emacs documentation, notably the part describing the motivations for the GNU project, the origin story of the GNU project. Uh, due to the GFDL, every version of Emacs, no matter what operating system it's running on, no matter if it's free or non-free, has included that, right? So the political quote unquote splash screen Emacs starts up with was many people's introduction to free software concepts, like it was mine, you know? I just saw this weird cursive, you know, Cal logo, and I was like, oh, what's this link? I'll click it. And then I ended up reading a political manifesto without realizing it, right? And to paraphrase another quote from uh, from RMS's uh, origin story of Emacs, Emacs, he was saying it there, but we can infer Emacs, was part of an explicit political campaign to make software free. And I think at its best, Emacs is exactly still that way. Um, so, but we need to keep things going, right? Emacs was, uh, say, let's let's say it was written in like 1980. You know, it's like kind of vague at which point Emacs really became Emacs. But how can we ensure that the Emacs spirit stays with us? Well, I have like one or two things maybe that I can that I can recommend. Um, first of all, you should use CopyLeft wherever possible, right? If you write software, uh, please consider releasing it under the GPL or another strong copyleft license to benefit the community. After all, this was a core part of Emacs, Emacs's success. You know, it doesn't bar you from selling software. In fact, the FSF used to sell Emacs on reel-to-reel -reel tape for $150 way back in the day. Um, and there are actually some behind me right now, but you can't see them. Uh, and insist on free software in other areas, right? In your operating system, in your phone, even in your GNU Linux distribution, right? It, you know, nominally could be free software, but it may not be fully free. Don't be content with 50%, 60%, or even 80%, you know, always be pushing for the extra, the extra bit to be freed, even if that's like a tiny bit at a time, and even if it seems impossible, right? With cell phones, you know, right now it seems like the mobile baseband of your phone will just never be free. It's like inconceivable. But I think if we rally enough people behind it, we could definitely get there. And that's like a very core element of of campaigning for software freedom and, and what has made Emacs so successful is that it has always strongly pushed uh, the copyleft philosophy. Um, and do all that you can to make the community welcoming too, right? Like that includes tolerance of the quote unquote non-hacker hackers like me and many others who, while not the most technical people do genuinely, genuinely like love Emacs and setting standards for good behavior i.e. codes of conduct are, I would say, a necessary part of this. Um, just in the case of underrepresented groups, people who, for whatever reason, don't feel like they're being, uh, you know, that that the audience that writes Emacs is not the audience that's speaking to them. Their contributions are also extremely valuable because Emacs could just get even more like incredible and strange if it's being attributed by people who, uh, you know, don't share the same perspective as you, don't share the same background as you. Um, and ways you can also support, uh, please support the FSF, not just because it pays my salary, but we write the GPL, we are the copyright holder for Emacs, and we take its legal protect protection extremely seriously. Um, and contribute to Emacs and every other free software project, doesn't have to be a new project as much as you can, because uh, no matter what it is, and no matter how small you think your con contribution may be, you know, chances are that there's like someone who has that one nagging bug that's like, if only someone could fix this for me, right? Like if only this would happen. And I, I, I've seen it happen in Emacs multiple times. Like, you know, I've had uh, one nagging thing that's like prevented me from, from you know, uh, most recently it was like, 
GNU's was always marking my uh, read emails unread again, and there was like nothing I could do. And then someone ended up fixing it with just like a single line commit or something a few weeks ago. Um, so, you know, if you notice anything like that, just, just please contribute it because every part benefits uh, the community. So I think that's uh, all I have for the slides, um, but I can take questions on IRC uh, fielded to me by Zoe, hopefully, because um, that will be the way that I'll see them the most quickly. Indeed. Thanks, Greg, for your talk. And sorry, we were juggling so many things, I totally forgot to give an introduction for you. But yes, we do have a couple of minutes of time to take questions from the IRC. There's a question here. Um, RMS was an important part of Emacs development. Okay, so I have one question. Um, RMS was an important part of Emacs development in light of recent events involving RMS. How do you feel we can move past an RMS-focused development process and towards a more inclusive, welcoming, nurturing process so that we can drive in, draw in more d diverse contributors? Um, well, to that, I would just say that like we should always be keeping the focus on free software as a shared uh, value and you know just like as long as we have that focus we can overcome a lot of like differences provided that we have the same like political perspective right emacs is essentially a political project um and and keeping that focus is is i think crucial to the continued success of emacs and free software generally i mean if if we're all on the same goal on the same page it, it becomes easier to uh bridge uh certain differences like that uh, what's my nagging, number one nagging bug wart missing feature right now? Okay, so I was actually trying to think of a way to work this in, but there used to be a, um, a music playing client called uh, Mingus, like Charles Mingus, like the jazz guy. Um, and I used to use that all the time. And then like four or five years ago, it stopped working. And I didn't know why it stopped working. Um, so now I use EMMS, which is really cool, but I always do miss uh, Mingus, which was a which was a music playing thing way back in the day. It was never in Cory Max, but it was like a package before the package manager. How to introduce uh, total non-information savvy users to Emacs? Um, wow, that's a good question. Um, I mean, generally, I would just say like, uh, hey, did you know that this thing that I type on can also play Tetris? And then do you know that this thing that I can type on that can play Tetris, I can also like look at the source code at any time? Isn't that cool? What if I put this letter here, this letter here, this letter here, you know? like. Uh, I think you can pretty easily get somebody engaged in Emacs. It's just a matter of uh, persistence and um, creativity. <laughs> How can I contribute to Emacs if I know very little Elisp? Um, well, the best way is documentation, right? We call Emacs self-documenting, but you know, and it is self-documenting to a degree. But it's self-documentation. Its documentation isn't always the most uh, expansive or readable. So if there's one part of Emacs uh, that you use a lot, even if it's just a package, and you notice that it doesn't have good documentation, or if you speak another language, um, contributing to documentation is always a good is always a good way to to benefit the community because. A lot of hackers don't have the ability to like write uh, 
good technical writing. I mean, you know, it's like, a, it's just a varied skill set. So that would be one way. Um, and just reporting bugs wherever possible. And um, yeah, you, you definitely don't have to be a programmer, I don't think, um, to make to make valuable contributions. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, hope to see you soon. And uh, OK, one last question. Emacs is a political project. Can you be precise? Uh, yes, uh, RMS refers to it as a political project in uh, the essay, uh, My History with uh, Lisp and the Development of GNU Emacs on GNU.org. Uh, that's the quote context for that statement. Um, but I have to sign out, so see you later. Thanks for, uh, thanks for your patience and all the te technical difficulties. Thank you.